Good morning. I hope who attended the dinner yesterday had a good time and more importantly engaged in the vigorous exercise that these days call it dancing. Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce a speaker who I've known for a long time. When they asked me would I introduce Ian Benson on his talk, I said yes. They said, do you know him? I said, I known him when he had a lot of hair and now he has got none. But I also believe that it would be nice for you guys to know not just about the speaker who's going to talk to you, but also about the lecture. It's the Anthony DiMarco lecture. And my first question is, who's Anthony DiMarco? And I had the pleasure to have met him a few minutes ago and knew that he is a, an MD, but he's always been interested in respiratory matters for a spinal patient. And he is aggrieved that we all concentrate on movement and sensation and the bladder and bowels, and we forget about the major killer in spinal patients called a respiratory dysfunction. So now you know who is Anthony DiMarco, and he graciously put out funds on a yearly basis to encourage young people like Mr. Benson to come and give a talk related to respiratory matters. Uh, Two liners, I keep saying to people, I'm a surgeon, I can't speak for more than two seconds. Uh, A.N. joined the National Spinal Injury Center at Stoke Mandeville Hospital 15 years ago, worked here, worked there, and ended up by being the lead clinicians on respiratory matters for the acute patient. Is also the chair of a an English group or a UK group which uh, called RISCI, which involved itself in respiratory matters. He's going to talk to us about ventilation and weaning in spinal cord injury, a problem solving approach. Ian. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Jamus, for that introduction. Got my hair. Uh, and thank you to Wiscos for giving me the opportunity to talk to you um, this morning. Um, an opportunity to talk about something I'm so, well, about my work and something I'm, I'm so passionate about. Um, it's a real honour to be here, um, and as Dr. Jamus said, to give you the Anthony DiMarco lecture. I had the pleasure of meeting him yesterday, and we had a really good conversation about the function of this lecture and the function of this talk and how it's there to report on the practical realities of the struggles that someone with spinal cord injury and ventilation or respiratory requirements have or has. Um, and so that's exactly what I plan to do today. So without further ado, I'd like to talk to you about ventilation and weaning in spinal cord injury. So we're going to go on a journey. I'm going to take you on a, on, on a journey where we're going to explore the clinical journey versus a patient journey of someone with a ventilation requirement, weaning from ventilation. We're going to explore the dif differences in management in weaning styles in the UK. We're going to talk about some common pitfalls encountered, as wise though, um, and strategies to avoid these situations. We're going to talk about some longer-term weaning considerations and make some future recommendations also. So it's very much a clinically-based presentation. So St. Mandeville is home, home for me, home for a few friends I can see in the audience, but also very much, as we did the other day, home originally, at least, for ISCOS too. We have 102 beds, so the largest centre in the UK, um, and we manage about 500 referrals per year over a catchment area of about 16 million people. We've got the second largest capacity for ventilated admissions in the UK at six, only six. Um, it means that the information is caveated to, to one single unit in the UK, 
but I do have national insight through RISCI, which we've just heard, is a special interest group in the UK. It stands for Respiratory Information in Spinal Cord Injury. It's a group of which I'm currently chair of. Um, I've been there for about 15 years, and I worked out the other day that I've been involved in the weaning of about 200, 225 patients, so quite a few. We have, an, we have a, an ITU attached to our general side, and a very wide and experienced spinal respiratory MBT. I work closely with our outreach team to try and improve the pathway and smooth out any issues before someone arrives to us. Um, we also have an aperture clinic where we can, we can evaluate the wean and management strategies that, that we employ with our patients, but also read them if, as and when we need to. All our patients who are discharged with ventilation or tracheostomy or respiratory support, we refer to an ongoing community respiratory team, which will help us do joint follow-ups, but also provide equipment um, and support post-discharge. All of our patients, incidentally, would, would come to us from a major, from a major trauma centre first, and then come to us at the spinal unit. If the length of, of wait for a bed is, is so long, they may end up going to their local district hospital and then come to us secondarily. So the pathway is not quite what it should be. Um, we have a national pre-admission data database with loads of information about patients before they come to us, so we have really good detail there. But there's no national database or registry about pay people after discharge from a spinal unit in terms of who needs ventilation and which you needs. So it's hard to know what exactly happens outside of each unit post-discharge. So the problem I'll present today is that we were noticing a very high frequency of weaning regressions on admission to the unit over, 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 over the years. Um, by regression, I mean someone came to us in a certain point in their wean plan, then we had to unpick aspects of their wean and... and, and Regress, move backwards. Move back, take a step backwards to move forwards. And this was either because the wean we felt was unsustainable, they became unwell, or had a limiting effect upon their rehabilitation. We've also noted recurrent problematic weaning in the pre-admission phase as well, noted on outreach calls and difficulties with referring teams. So it poses the question of what's seen first. Is it the ventilator that's seen first, or is it a human being attached to that ventilator with a spinal cord injury? And I'd argue that if you see, if the ventilator is seen first, then that can very much skew the approach that's taken and may, end up, may, may very much change where you end up. So I did an audit. This is, it's fairly crude data, so if, if Yost is in, is, is in the audience, please don't look too, too closely at it. Um, so I looked at the, the admissions over the last 10 years to the unit. And I excluded any readmissions or patients who were ventilated secondarily from a deterioration some months into their admission. And I found that two-thirds, I've got a pointer here, two-thirds, two-thirds of, of the patients needed a regression. Very high number. Um, the number one reason for regression was an ongoing area of collapse or consolidation. In the group that did not need regression, they all had norm normal PCO2s and normal and clear lung fields as well. On average, the regression group took about four months longer to get to us, and, was with, and were with us for about two months longer. But crucially, they had poor outcomes as well. So only two-thirds of them either stayed where they were or got back to where they were, and then had a forward progression in their wean, but a third actually went backwards and ended up needing more ventilator support or more, more respiratory support on discharge. Um, now, there was no significant correlation with pathological history within this, but I'd argue that if someone has a pre-existing diagnosis of airways disease, that's even more reason to not wean someone out of their means. So to, to begin to understand this more, this slide looks at the differences in an ICU-guided wean compared to, with, with non-spinal patients compared to what we as spinal cord injury professionals would recommend as part of a wean. So the first, first of all, we're looking at tidal volume. We would use much higher tight target tidal volumes to ventilate. So 7 to 15 is per kilogram as opposed to 4 to 6. Why? Because we're dealing with different things. We're dealing with patients who have mechanical insufficiency as opposed to lung pathology issues. And therefore, we're not only replacing tidal volume with ventilation, we're looking to compensate for FRC as well. So we'll use higher tidal volumes to very, to very much combat the mechanical changes that we see. 
cuffiflation and therefore swelling rehabilitation and ability to speak in an ITU guided wean is all delayed until someone is off the ventilator. Whereas with a spinal wean, as I'd call it, we're looking to drop the cuff much, much earlier in the process, okay? And therefore using the pressure of the ventilator to augment speech, to augment that swelling, swelling function. Um, the intervention parameters in an ITU tend to be very much support mode, spontaneous mode. The idea being that you want to engage someone on a ventilator and, and use the ventilator to augment their, their function and make them work a bit harder on the ventilator before you take them off. Whereas in a spinal patient, we want control modes. We want to rest someone completely on, on a ventilator. Um, and you may, you may argue that being on a ventilator is rest in itself, but when you have a VC of, an FEC of someone of 4% of, of, of normal, then even a triggered mode on a ventilator with a pressure cycled mode can be enough to fatigue someone. Um, the winning method in ITU tends to be a gradual reduction in parameters, everything's turned down, and then off the ventilator quite quickly. With the idea being, again, to engage someone's own muscle power. But with a spinal patient, does that work? Not really, no. So we use progressive vent-free breathing. We use interval training for the diaphragm, interval training for the residual muscles. So you intersperse periods of work off, off the ventilator with complete rest back on the ventilator. So I mentioned about the difference in the primary underlying defect um, and the fact that the evidence base, well, the, 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 the evidence base is variable in both, but in but both weans, but severely lacking in the spinal cord injury wean um, I, ideal. Clinical strategies tend to be very reactive in ITU, um, where you're looking to encourage someone's independent function, improving their cough strength, improving their ability to take deep breaths. But with a spinal patient, that might, not ne that might never change. Therefore, we're always looking at mechanically um, augmented methods of, of clearance and always very prophylactic. It's far easier to keep a chest clear than it is to clear a chest once you have a problem. Um, and to evaluate a wean in ITU, mainly looking at oxygen saturations and you may allow a degree of permissive hypercapnia, again, with, with this lung pathology issue to be, uh, as, as, as a core cause. Um, but whereas with spinal cord injuries, we're looking at, um, what we're looking at? We're looking at carbon dioxide, P, no, not looking to maintain a normal PCO2. We're looking at vital capacity measurements and spirometry and chest X-rays. So again, very much a mechanical way of, of, of eva evaluating the wean, which has a mechanical nature and origin. So <clears throat> it's worth noting at this point that most patients in a non-spinal unit will start on the ITU pathway to begin with. But the problem is that a spinal patient doesn't fit the ITU model of ventilation or weaning for the issues we've just discussed. Um, because we're dealing with different things. We're dealing with mechanical insufficiency as opposed to lung pathology as a primary, primary issue. Um, in ITU, it may be that areas of, of mild atelectasis may be tolerated, as would some permissive hypercapnia, to speed up the wean process, to get some off the wean, off the ventilator faster, to get them out of ITU, for example. But that very much goes against the underpinning mechanics of a spinal cord injury, and the reason that they're ventilated as well. And if, it's, and you have, if you're in an area of collapse, or you have a high CO2 on the ventilator, well, that's not going to get better when you come off the ventilator. It's going to get worse and cause problems. The impact of spinal cord injury can be heavily underestimated. So spirometry is not always conducted in non-specialist in non, non ITUs. And the effect of fatigue and expa the, the effect of, of, on clearance of, mu of muscular fatigue in the context of a spinal cord injury um, and, and the need for lung expansion can be heavily, heavily underestimated also. There are sp spinal cord injury specific wean guidance available. Ris Risky has a very good one. Um, but, and this is often acknowledged, but the key aspects can be missed, such as the, we the wean has begun without that prior optimization. You want to get someone as good as possible before you start to take them off the, off the ventilator, before you start that um, progressive decruitment um, process. Um, and also the cuff deflation or avoiding cut deflation. It's true that an incomplete patient, so an ASD, for example, may actually do better on an intensive care wean 
or may, um, may actually manage quite well. And, the, and the, the consideration here is that if you have a patient, a very incomplete patient going through the IC model, then that might qualify that approach if the depth of knowledge of spinal cord injuries isn't necessarily there. I hope that makes sense. Um, reactive versus prophylactic assessments. So again, in ITU, you may be looking at more, the more in-depth clinical evaluation strategies, such as a blood gas or, a, or a, if someone's heart line's been taken out, or a chest x-ray, once you have a problem, once, you ha once something, something goes wrong. But by the time you investigate, the issue may already be, be, be there. Whereas we'd look at, in the spinal cord injury mindset, we'd be looking at doing these assessments prophylactically to make sure that we can maintain what we achieve. Dysphagia is tackled post-wean, again with, with, the, with, the, with the dropping of the cuff post-wean um, from ventilation. Now the issue here is, if you have someone with dysfunctional swallow post spinal cord injury, and you take away the pressure of the ventilator, then that swallow may be actually more dysfunctional. Without the, the pressure, the benefit of dropping the cuff on the ventilator, apart from speech, is that you can use the pressure of the ventilator to aid your higher laryngeal excursion, and therefore you get a better quality swallow, at least in the, in the early phase. Um, and therefore, to take some off the, off the ventilator and then try and expect them to, 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 to swallow and have, and have that, harness that muscle power, it's a lot to ask of someone. And so we see quite a lot of problems in the cuff up wean off the ventilator that sometimes, well, most times, we have to unpick by going back on the ventilator and starting again. Um, other things to consider, we have an evolving role of the major trauma centers that I think we've, we've heard quite a lot of over the last few days. So people are spending more time at the major trauma centres and there's a need for the major trauma centres and the non-specific to use to do more with the weaning and do more with the rehab side of it as well. Okay? There's been a lot of acute investment in the UK into that acute pathway over the last few years um, and it's made huge changes and it's been brilliant. Um, but the, the, this... this, this, this the pathway hasn't quite spread to the, res to, the to, the, to the respiratory issues in the level of depth that we're discussing here today. And that's very much the, 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 missing, the missing link. Um, there's an index point of becoming a spinal cord injury. So you don't necessarily know someone's a spinal cord injury until a certain amount of time has passed. So unless someone has, has been woken up and the full extent of their paralysis is known, and therefore what their longer term or even, even short mid-term respiratory needs will be, then it stands to reason that people will be started on a ITU guidance as opposed to going straight onto, an IT, uh, on, onto a spinal cord injury guidance. If you had someone that you weren't sure was paralyzed to that extent, then why would you, put, why, why, why would you give them the tidy volume of 15 mils per kilogram? If you sort of what I mean. So that's another point to, 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 to try and unpick. Bed pressures, so people can be weaned quickly to get out of ITU. Tracheostomies are wardable, where the ventilators are not. So people can go to the wards, general wards out of ITU with a tracheostomy, and therefore that can also be an incentive to get people out of ITU and move through the pathway quicker. But it can, cause a, it can very, very much be a false economy, as if that patient deteriorates or needs reventilation, then how is that managed on a general ward, it's probably not until, until they actually deteriorate sufficiently to go way back in the plan, back to ITU. Unfamiliarity can be, an option, can be an issue also. I'm speaking from a position where all we see is people with perspective injuries, and our environment is set up to manage that, whereas in major trauma centers and, and ITU, in general particular ITUs, they're dealing with many different types of patients, and spinal cord injuries is just one, one, one Uh, section, one, one subgroup. Um, the consistency of team and approach can also be a factor. So quite often in ITU, there can be a, 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 a weaning plan, plan put in place with a team on one day, then the next day the team changes, the consultant team changes with different ideas, and therefore the plan that was put in place two days previously has changed hugely. And that's a real problem also. So those of you who flew to Edinburgh, I'd like you to consider if you had just one degree of course, of course correction at takeoff in the flight, 
what effect that would have on the destination that you got to. So you may not have ended up in Edinburgh. Depending on where you started from, you may end up in Norway or somewhere in the North Sea. But the point is that even an even a in, in, inconsequential change, or what may seem inconsequential at the very beginning, in the early phases, you may not see the effect of that until much further down the line. I'd like to introduce Dee Dee. Dee Dee is our first subject for today. And she's going to help us explain these issues further, but from a service user's point of view. And I really hope the videos work. Um, so she had a spine injury after a fall at home, and she went to a major trauma center and then to a local district, district hospital. And it took her three months to come to us. She was very much on the ITE pathway before she got to us. And all the weaning attempts were all cuff up on spontaneous modes. And she managed 15 mi minutes vent free breathing. Once she came to us at the unit, we put her back on the ventilator completely, kept the cuff up, and put her onto a control mode, and then dropped the cuff, and then went in the weaning plan. So she was discharged, not totally ventilated, and then had some attempts to wean onto NIV in the community. But this is her experience of that initial wean. It was a horrible experience, not pleasant at all. So we started weaning off for one minute, and then uh, two minutes, three minutes, and it was, never, it was never getting easy. It was three sessions a day, starting from one minute, three times a day, and then slowly increasing. I think it got to 12 minutes. And <coughs> luckily, I got the call from Stockman de Ville. I thought, okay, let's just stop everything. Uh, I'll just start again when we get there. It was not nice, it was horrible, it wasn't getting any easier. Um, at some point, I stopped doing it three times a day. I said, I can't cope with this, it's too much. We were doing it only twice a day. It was hard, it was like breathing with an elephant sitting on my chest. It was um, scary and really, really difficult. My saturation wasn't dropping, apparently. It was all good. And so they just kept pushing me harder and harder, more and more. And I didn't know any difference. I thought maybe at some point, like when you train, when you run, it's very hard. When you run 5K the first time, and that slowly gets easier and easier. But for me, it wasn't getting any easier at all. It was horrible. Okay, so a horrible experience. Not getting any easier. But my sons are okay, so we kept going. Now, the purpose of this talk is to not, not to bash ITUs is not to bash mid-term centers at all, because I think what they do is amazing. But it's, it's to highlight the importance of the differences and the, ne and, and, and the, the key differences with weaning someone with, it, with mechanical insufficiency. Subject number two is Steve. Steve had his injury with, during, uh, as a result of a, of a cycling crash, and he, his pathway was very different. So he came to us just two weeks after his spinal injury, um, with no previous winning attempts, so we're able to put him straight on our spinal pathway, as it were. Um, he was weaned through the daytime, and like DD, discharged with ventilation overnight. Um, and this is his experience of the, of the additional wean. I think it was pitched at the right level, although it did feel... When you go from 24 by 7, ventilator and you're trying to go to 10 minutes without a ventilator it's there's a certain amount of fear because I didn't know whether I could breathe at all without the vent slowly I managed to develop the ability to do that but I think that was largely <coughs> that was largely through the weaning process which I was very grateful for it being very slow because it meant that I didn't need to worry about getting from let's say 10 minutes on a Monday to an hour on Wednesday week um, because I would have seen that was too big, a, too big an objective um, and it would have been demotivating going from 10 minutes to 15 minutes to 20 minutes 
over a two or three week period was potentially much more achievable. And in that case, um, as I said, it gave me objectives that I was willing to sign up for, along with the team looking after me. So even with what we regard as the best pathway, it's still hard work, it's still scary, it's still fear-inducing, and it needs to be steady progress. So what does the evidence say? How can the evidence support us with, with, what, with, what, with, what, with, what, with what I'm saying? So I've picked out a couple of things there on this slide, which are the key components, if you like. So first of all, high tidal volumes. In ITU guidance, we use well, 46 mils per kilogram is used to calculate tidal volumes. Why? For lung protection strategies to avoid barotrauma and to avoid the risk of ARDS, acute repetitive distress syndrome. But with, an, with a spinal patient, the risk is different because the mechanical changes, again, as, as I keep, keep saying, um, there's no change in, in, in lung compliance acutely. If anything, the, the, the lung compliance increases during spinal shock. And therefore, the risk of using a lung protecting strategy is that you can actually hypoventilate somebody. Okay? Um, and therefore, that's, that, that, that can lead to areas of eclipsis, conservation. So if you think back to the audit slide earlier on, could that, could that be a linking factor? So we know that high, higher volumes can reduce and resolve areas of collapse, reduce wound duration, what can augment speech and combat this feeling of breathlessness that we see in our patients. With the, with the PVFB um, approach, there's only really been one comparison study, and that's almost 30 years old now. And that study compared PVFB to SIMV weaning and found, of course, to be significantly better and more effective in high tension speech patients. But not only that, it provides a, a functional way of weaning for someone who can't wean completely off a ventilator. They have time off the away from ventilation. So there's a real need there for, to look, look at more evidence or to conduct more evidence. Early cutiflation, PVFB, and critical weaning is widely used within the spinal units. So again, with the lack of evidence, that's, that, that, that's, the, that's the connection between clinical practice and evidence and how they don't quite match as much as we'd like them to be. Um, we have a risky, we a go line through risky, um, which I've got linked to it towards the end. Um, and these are national guidance that we've written. We're on our second edition at the minute um, with the idea to, be, be to, to have a guideline for the use in non-specific ITUs. And there's an upcoming pre-wean pre requisites document as well, which will help with that initial phase. Um, but also on that, I've been involved in a, with some colleagues writing a, a review of the current evidence that's out there. Um, and it's currently uh, waiting for publication, and it's this this link just to here, and uh, this was written with a non-specific ITU after a very difficult exchange that we had, and it was felt that we needed to write something, get something on the board. So that's very exciting, and hopefully that will lead to something, to, 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 to more papers and the like. Um, the evidence is insufficiency, well, it's easy, easy to say it's insufficient in relation, in relation to ITU guidance, but the ITU guidance is fairly nebulous as well, and can be very, very variable. So what's needed is multi-centre investigations. If there's any, anyone out there that's interested or has any burning desire, then please get in touch, because that's right on my street. I asked Dee Dee if she could talk to the team about the issues that she was facing and could talk through the problems. This is what she said. I felt I could talk to them, and they were doing their best, trying to help me, support me, give, him all the, give me all the support. Uh, that they thought was, I mean, they were really great, but I just think it, it wasn't working for me and I normally never give up, so I just kept going on and trying and trying and um, thinking that at some point it would have been easier, but it never got easy. So it's important to know that this doesn't come from any malicious intent. No one's setting out to, to make things harder for anyone. Uh, it comes from a, a point of, of, of awareness, but also e even sometimes a lack of awareness, but sometimes even with the awareness, it's trying to make those changes strategically. So you tend to see the differences between the two cases and what a turbulent time that someone can have if they're not on the, the right pathway from the, from the beginning. So what effect does this have on, on someone? Now, this is my attempt at a word cloud. 
Um, and these are all words from patients over the years who have described their initial weaning difficulties. So very isolating, misunderstood, painful, anxiety related, out of control, despondent, confusing, confusing, confusing disengaging. Now, it's worth saying as well that all this may well be communicated with a cuff up as well. And if you're trying to, to convey, convey with, with, with significant paralysis, the fact that you can't breathe and you're really struggling with your wean through lip reading with a cuff up, and, but you're still being told that your scents are okay, keep going, that's not a nice place to be. So utero mantra is weaning should never be physically difficult with spunk injury. And if it is, then there's something, something not right. Um, this is Dee Dee's viewpoints on weaning. Take two, once she came to us at the unit. So when I then went to um, stop Hanville, it was a relief because cup up, I was also relieved, even if that meant not eating or drinking or talking, but it was a relief. And then slowly we started with cup down and then increasing the time, uh, getting to being able to have cup down for 24 hours. And then only then we started the weaning slowly and everything was easy. I had to learn to talk and to talk with the, or even to cope with the cup down. Yeah. Because now when I go on the ventilator over, overnight, I'm eating, drinking, talking, it feels normal. But I remember really well the feeling of the cup coming down. It's a different way the air goes through, differently through your airways. And it, it's hard even talking because you just need to learn. Now I don't feel the difference, but at the time it felt even, even that was hard, even just having the cup down was hard. Leave alone, cup down and off the vent all at the same time. So there's two really good points there. Number one, the benefit of a clear and consistent plan. It felt like a relief, to use Didi's words. But also the cuff deflation. Now it's very easy for us to say in a weaning plan or recommendations, oh well just drop the cuff and this is how you start the wean and then once you've done that then the rest is easy. It's true, but we're saying that from, 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 a, from an environment where our ventilators will compensate for leak. All of our team know what to expect when the cuff is down. Our vents don't alarm low pressure, low peep, low pressure, low peep, constantly when, when the cuff is deflated. And we know that our vents will compensate for that leak and, and maintain someone very, very nicely. But in, again, in an ITU, if the cuff is dropped and someone has that reaction, so no, it's very rare that someone enjoys the cuff deflation straight away. It can feel uncomfortable. They can have a mouthful of secretions. They can be coughing. It can be, it can be very irritating. You almost have to resist the urge to suction and cause more irritation, but then balance that between the risk of aspiration. But that's a very specific risk assessment, with, and you have to have the knowledge and the experience or at least the guidance to be able to know that, that we can endure this. Otherwise, you may try it and think the patients like it. No one, no one wants to cause any harm, therefore it can be abandoned, didn't do so well with the cuff down, therefore let's go back to what we know in terms of a cuff up wing. In the next section, I'd like to talk about the longer term wing considerations. So, a bit, bit, of, a, bit of a skip forwards here. Longer term viewing considerations are someone with a tracheostomy and a ventilator. You may be, may be thinking in the audience, these two patients seem okay, why are they still ventilated? Why do they still have, have their tracheostomy tubes in? Um, so I asked the question to Dee Dee, what's your perception of the tracheostomy? Do you see the tube and the ventilator as a positive or a negative? 100% positive, 100% positive. It is. It's, it's difficult. I, I, I went through, the, through many emotions and to, through many different change of minds on this. So at different stage, stages, I would probably answer differently. At this moment in time, the vent overnight is allow me to feel great or as good as I can be during the day. So I guess is a positive. I mean, it comes with a lot of uh, little issues. It, you know, having a track is not great, and for sure. But because I tried and I had the opportunities to try 
many different scenarios. I think this works good for me, works the best for me. Okay. And then Steve's thoughts on keeping a tracheostomy and ventilator. Now, don't forget, but both these patients have tried NIV and they've tried to wean further. So I think the other benefit of having the tracheostomy and ventilation is that if I do get an infection, we can manage it at home. I did have an experience where I had a lung infection and I actually went into intensive care um, as an inpatient. That was quite challenging because the intensive care unit didn't actually know how to manage the spinally injured patient who required ventilation. Um, so we managed our way through, but I felt I was taking up the bed in an inappropriate area of the hospital. Um, the benefit though was that we learned from that and subsequent issues can be far easily far more easily managed from home because we've got the experience of what will work and what won't work. What is it I'm suffering from now? Is it something we've had before? Probably very likely. What have we learned? What have we do with it? You can do all that stuff at home now. So having the benefit of the ventilation and the tracheostomy allows us to do that. So let's, 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 let's explore that a bit further. So we could wean further, but the, my question is, should we wean further? So real careful consideration is needed with this. And in, in our MDTs, when we, when we reach the final stages of a wean plan, this is something that we always have long and in in, in-depth discussions about. So it's more than a good VC and having a coffee machine. So much more than that. We know that people's rehab priorities and perspective on, on their injuries can change uh, with an evolving spinal cord injury. And the perception of how things are straight after injury compared to discharge, compared to five, ten years down the line, it changes. And it makes, uh, and therefore poses the question, what's our attitude to ventilation and tracheostomies as clinicians, positive or negative? I'm reminded of a conversation, or many conversations I have with our community repetition teams who will say that when they have a referral for somebody, not necessarily us anymore, but for, for someone, their first, their first plan is how can we progress someone further? How can we get someone off the ventilator for longer? How can we take the tracheostomy out? Now, for many, many patients, that could be exactly what's needed. Someone perhaps, perhaps, perhaps has, has not had a, a good enough bite of the cherry during COVID or would be the issues with logistics of being in, 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 in an award, may well be very appropriate. But is it the right approach for someone who's been an inpatient in a spinal unit for the last year and has tried many types of weaning? Potentially not. So that's where the close link is so important. Um, so are, are, is, is it a positive or a negative to wean? Are, are a tracheostomy ventilator positive or negative? And I would say it's positive if it sustains and enables someone to function. This can be a quite a familiar, unfamiliar concept for an ITU. And, and the ITU and the ITU experience is important because a lot of our patients who need these devices will be or come through ITU. But the negativity around a tracheostomy ventilator can rub off with someone on someone with spinal cord injury at the patient phase. So you've got to think: what's the pathway if that patient becomes unwell? What happens if they have an infection? How will that be managed? And it's never use, it, it, it's never nice to have an infection during a weaning plan, for, for example. Um, but it can be useful, or we see it as useful. Because if someone can maintain their weaning status with an infection and manage the increase in secretion load, manage that period of being unwell without going backwards in the weaning plan, then that's, isn't, isn't that a really nice acid test of a wean plan? Not to say that we give people infections to test the wean, but it's useful if, if we have them. Um, we then have the, the, the conversation of risk of infection versus the management of the infection. Now, the other argument is, well, a tracheostomy being, being, in, being in place is a source for infection. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a cause of it, irritation as well. And I'd be the first to not disagree with that. But the counter-argument 
would be, well, it's not the causing the infection, it's how that infection is managed. And if that patient has, has, has an infection, and yes, can manage with just an increase in, in, in airway clearance, having antibi uh, antibiotics at home, without any need for more suction or, or using the tracheostomy as such, then fine, yes, take the tube out. But if that patient has an increased need, need for suction, or their non-invasive clearance is so difficult, it's so fatiguing, it takes up six hours of their day, then is having a tube a negative? Um, do I have time for that slide? Yes, yeah, so if weaning isn't a good idea, we're about to switch to NIV. This is Steve's thoughts. I really struggled moving to a face mask because I can't move my hands, can't move my arms. If I wake up in the night and I'm uncomfortable, it's very difficult to call out in the mask and there's nothing I can do to alleviate what could be a very uncomfortable situation until my carer turns up to try and take the mask off and then we reassess. And we're going to put it back on again. Or shall we just plug the ventilator in? Because we know that works. Um, and invariably, we go, we're going back to the ventilator. I still have a nasal mask to try, but I'm struggling to try it because of care and consistency. So by no means am I saying that you should never use an IV keep everyone on track me and keep everyone on the ventilator because it works really well for, for a large number of people. But I'm trying to, well, the point I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying, trying to make is there's a cohort of, of, of patients that may well benefit from not having that tracheostomy out. And actually, keeping the tube in and deciding to take the tube in isn't a negative thing to do. So what, what are the future steps? Well, ideally, we'd have loads of money invested into the spinal units Increase capacity and admit sooner. Thanks very much. Um, it's not, 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 not as easy as that, unfortunately, but it would make a big difference. Um, but is this sustainable? No. I mean, we, we don't want to keep all the information and all the experience and all the knowledge within the spinal units. So, my view would be an early involvement at that index point of spinal injury to make sure that we're on that spinal pathway from the very, very start. And that could be in the form of launching education bundles. So as soon as, as, soon as someone's referred, then we have a, 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 a bundle and a, and a knowledge bundle, education bundle that can be launched straight away. Someone's on the right pathway from the very start. But the big challenge is how to affect change. It's very, it's very easy and it's very nice for me to sit with that, with that reach with a group of physios in the referring hospitals because you can, you can talk to them, or physios, and you can talk to them and, and, and they can understand where, where we're coming from and understand why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but the real challenge is talking to the medical teams, the consultant teams, and trying to convince them that we, we have, we have, our patients have different needs and very much the flavor of this, this whole talk. So that's really the challenge to get to, 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 to get buy-in from the medical teams, the consultant teams. Um, and but we'd, we'd always invite them to join our outreach meetings. Some of them, some of them will, will join, but not consistently. The answer, the, a good idea is to con construct joint guidance and pathways with referring it ITUs, not just give them protocols. People want protocols. People want to say, what's your protocol for weaning? What's your protocol for ventilation? And yes, we can give it to you, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Because if we use the example of taking the cuff down, for example, if our weaning plan says take the cuff down, and you try it and it doesn't work, and then we have a conversation to say, well, did you try the cuff down? Yeah, we did, but our vent probably won't compensate for the leak. Fine, like you do, 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 do a blood gas. We're taking the outline out, okay? And then, therefore, it becomes very difficult to evaluate that, that, that plan. So the protocols, just giving protocols, doesn't necessarily work. But if you have buy-in from the teams to construct joint guidance with them and, feel, and the, the teams to feel involved and part of it, then that's, that's a much better way of managing it. Um, we have our risky pre-win records document that should be launching um, anytime soon. 
But with the discussion about the long-term weaning, it, m it makes me wonder whether or not we need something, some, some guidance for the long-term wean as well, and the post-discharge weaning considerations as opposed to, uh, as well as the acute side. Um, but is there an opportunity for change? So the Wean Safe, Pro Wean, Wean Safe, Pro Wean Safe Project is, is, is something that, that you may, may be familiar with or may, may have heard of. It's a, it's a huge multi-country um, study um, that was published early in the year, and it's, it's around weaning in ITU for non-spinal patients as such, or general, but everyone weaning from ITU. And it's a big, um, there's 5,000 5, participants, or 5,000 subjects over 50 countries, and they found basically that only 65% of weaning in ITU is successful after 90 days. And that's huge. That's huge. So there's a big call for consensus guidelines and a, and a review of how weaning, in, 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 in the wider sense, is, is managed. And I wonder whether or not that's a good opportunity for us to fly the, light, fly the flag for our spinal cord injured patients to get their needs on the, on the, on the, on the bigger stage. What happens to long to, to, to vintage patients? Again, having some kind of registry or having some kind of database to look at something for the data collection would be really, really useful. Um, and you can see that there's many research priorities for the future also. So the document on the left is our risk guidelines, which you can see from our, which you can find upon our, ooh, find on our website. And this is the WeInsafe document I was telling you about. So to summarize, um, there's fundamental differences that exist between an ITU and a spinal cord injury, a spinal cord injured wean approach. Not directly well evidence-based in, in the case of spinal, but papers do exist that support uh, and negate factors, but you very much have to know where you're looking for, where, where, to, where to find these things and what you're looking for. Um, more capacity and, and, and treating input is, input is needed, but despite acute investment, Barriers remain, and that experience skill is needed to unpick the specifics of the respiratory problems early on. Ultimate time point, in my view, is that index point of spinal cord injury. Respiratory goals and viewpoints do and can change, can and do change um, with time. Consider the, the, the holistic factors when planning a long-term wean, and further evidence base is needed to very much back up what I'm saying and, and take it to the next level. But it makes you wonder what is what is successful weaning? Is it pushing someone as far as they can go and taking the tube out because you can, or is it enabling someone or providing a means of sustaining and enabling someone to participate fully in in, 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 in the life that they deserve? To finish off with, then, I asked at the very beginning what, what, what we see first: the ventilator or the spinal patient. I'm going to show you this video. And we'll see what you think. Hey, I just thought I'd let you know that A, I'm not invincible since I got COVID last week, which really sucks, but it was not going to stop me from coming to Italy. And here we are. I just thought that I need to send you proof that I'm here. We made it and the weather is beautiful. And the regatta is happening on Sunday, so we are very excited. Bye! I know what I think. So thank you very much for listening. The plan initially was for Didi and Steve to be here today. And I, I, my plan was to have them here on stage and do almost like a live interview and a live Q&A. Um, but with the stress involved in even doing the videos, even if I had hair during the process, I think I probably would have, would have lost it in the stress of actually having them here, up here at the same time. And plus, they're, they're, they're away. Didi's in, in Italy at Sede Regatta, and Steve's in Portugal for, two, for three weeks. And if that doesn't, doesn't um, illustrate a, 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 successful we, a successful rehabilitation of these patients, I'm not sure what else does. So thank you very much for your time, and yeah, thank you.
I said we can have some questions if anybody has got, please do. Thanks, Ian. That was brilliant. Um, I was wondering, have you had any similar opportunities to present in like ITU conferences? Because my feeling watching was it that you're kind of preaching to the converted here. Yes. Like, I was nodding along to the whole thing of that, and I see that struggle of the people have one weaning plan one day, and then the next day it changes, and the patient's just like, I don't want to hear anything else until they just decide what they're doing. Yeah. How, what's your reception been with kind of... Uh, yeah, a, like a conference setting in, for ITU consultants? Um, I think the big benefit of the article that we wrote, um, it's with, with people for, for publication, um, that was written with non-specialist ITU consultants. And after a long discussion, because that, that came from a very, as I mentioned it before, a very difficult exchange where... Um, I had to work very hard to convince them to try small aspects of a wean because it wasn't, wasn't working with this particular patient. Um, and they were very sceptical until they tried it. And the next time we had a meeting, they said, oh, this is fantastic, this is great. Why doesn't, it, why doesn't everyone do this? And then those discussions became what they did and then it led to an article. So I'm hoping that that degree of engagement and being published in an ITU journal opens the door um, but yes, to, to present something similar at an, at, at an ITU conference would be, would be brilliant and Thanks very important. Very Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I think just to comment, um, Gianna Rodriguez from the University of Michigan. Hi. Um, I think you all are aware that in the U.S. we have significant stress on... Um, getting patients discharged from inpatient rehab. Um, we do accept patients on the ventilator in our inpatient rehab unit. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done, and this is probably something that you can model, <laughs> um, is that we've partnered with the pulmonary group, so the critical care pulmonary group, and, and we have at least about five pulmonologists who are specifically um, in tune with neuromuscular respiratory failure. And so they, we've, the partnership has been significant because then we're able to work very closely together so that we're, and we only really have, you know, at the most eight weeks for somebody with a cervical spinal cord mm -hmm. injury on the ventilator. Um, and so we really have to get things going um, right away. And then also, it's a fine line between, you know, getting the patient to therapies and weaning, you know, as you know. Yes. So the, the close partnership with the pulmonary physicians have been critical or has been critical. Yep. And we also created what you call an, an, an adult-assisted ventilation clinic. So the patients who are discharging from our inpatient rehab unit are are seen at the interdisciplinary clinic that's together with physical medicine and rehab hmm. and pulmonary. And, you know, we've tried to <coughs> educate um, the other pulmonologists yes. who are not kind of in sync. Um, so the group has been able to educate the other pulmonary physicians as well. So, um, you know, if you'd like to collaborate, we'll be happy to. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I suppose on that, if, if, I, if there was enough, sorry. I, I, I think we need to wrap up now. Oh. Thank you very much, Ian, for a very wonderful lecture. It reminded me uh, it's I, the same subject that we've been discussing 20 years ago and still coming back. Thank uh, you. Uh, Thank you. Oh.